أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم والله غفور رحيم قل اطيعوا الله والرسول فان تولوا فان الله لا يحب إن الله اصطفى آدم ونوحا وآل إبراهيم وآل عمران على العالمين ذرية بعضها من بعض والله سميع عليم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه كل القلوب إلى الحبيب تميل كل القلوب كل القلوب إلى الحبيب تميل ومعي بذاك ومعي بذلك ومعي بهذا شاهد ودليل أما الدليل أما الدليل إذا ذكرت محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم صار دموع صار دموع العاشقين تسيل مولاي صلي وسلم
So it's my great pleasure, really my great, great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, it's really a dream come true to have him with us. You'll see why in a minute. I'd, I'll let it, the main event speak for itself. But Dr. Ogwanaike um, is just somebody who's had a really deep impact on my life and somebody who's imparted such wisdom, such love, such support throughout the way. Um, and really consider him a, a brother, and it's just so beautiful to, that, to bring him here, uh, to work with Wasa, to bring him here, um, to share everything he has to give with you, or really just a small drop of the ocean of his knowledge um, to share with you. Um, so, um, you know, outwardly he's professor, uh, associate professor of um, Islam and Democracy in Africa, Islam in Africa at the University of Virginia. Um, and, but he's taken academia by storm and he's taken our hearts by storm as well. So um, I really, you'll, you'll hear what he has to say. So I'll let that speak for itself. But please do read his writings and watch his uh, videos on YouTube if you haven't seen them already. Probably some people in the audience have seen him speak on Islamic art at Zaytuna speak on decolonizing the uh, curriculum. He also spoke about that at Zaytuna and published with Rana Vertio. Um, his book, his first book, Deep Knowledge, is really a revelation. It's studying ways of knowing in Tijani Sufism. 
in Nigeria and Senegal, and also the Nigerian Ifa tradition, which is part of the Yoruba religion, which is heritage comes from. Um, and it's an it's a oral scripture, it's an oratio, um, kind of like the I Ching, you, you cast cowrie shells and then based on the sign, it, you get the mythology that, that solves your problem. So he's, he studied each of these and then he's compared them, but instead of using Western academic frameworks as, as the basis, you know, having the dead white men be the di dictators of the discourse, what he does is he looks at Ifa from the perspective of Tajani Sufism and then he looks at Tajani hmm. Sufism from the perspective of Ifa. So it's really um, methodologically a groundbreaking work and, and just a, such a profound piece. And he's also written um, the book on what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, West African Praise Poetry, Poetry and Praise of Prophetic, perfect, uh, prophetic Perfection, um, in which he really not only brings forth um, the depths of the West African pr poetry, uh, Praise Poetry tradition, but gives really the most profound metaphysical exposition of this. Um, and this is something that <coughs> it takes years and years to, to understand the depth of the metaphysics of this poetry. Um, and he's put it all there in one book and he's gonna share that with us tonight. Um, and also each one of his different articles um, kind of shifts your perspective when you think about any of the many topics that he's written about race, coloniality, the environmental crisis, police brutality, um, Islamic studies, um, Christopher Nolan's inception, um, uh, West African Sufi music videos, um, and um, the, the problem of pure consciousness in, in mysticism, that's a beautiful one. Um, and so many really wonderful uh, insights. So, you know, I could speak for the whole hour, it, this is my own attempt at a praise poem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <stop all> <laughs> um, but I'll uh, turn the floor over to him and um, thank you all for coming. And uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala sallam Muhammad al-Fatima al-Ghaliq wa khatima al-Sadaq. Naasul haqq bil haqq wal hadi la siratika al-Mustaqimi wa ala alihi haqqa qalimu kul alayhi Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'd like to thank my brother, really, he's, he's like my brother. He comes over to our house for Thanksgiving. He's part of the family. In our family, we call him Prince Nico. Yeah. Uh, but what you guys don't know is this is the person who introduced me to Tasawwuf. This is the person who introduced me. So in praising me, he's praising himself. Everything good that's come out of me has come as a result of the things that he, that he the books he gave me when yeah, we, were, we were roommates in undergrad all four years. I taught and, you how not to behave. That's, no, that's, no, my, no. that's why I no, so, take credit for. So you, you get anything, a, a lot of, if not all of the, the, the good things that have come out of this have been as a result of, of your influence. Um, so I'm sorry, after his introduction, I can't possibly live up to that. So please lower the expectations or you're going to be in for a very disappointing evening. Um, well, alhamdulillah, I want to thank uh, Baraka Blue and Sam and Wasat for um, having me here to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Uh, poetry, particularly Madih poetry, in praise of God's beloved and our beloved Sayyidina Muhammad. So, poetry um, in the Islamic tradition is, is, is a bit of a paradox because it's everywhere. Everywhere, pious Muslims, non pious Muslims, everybody loves poetry. You go to the, you know, some of the most profligate places, the parliaments of some of these Muslim countries, people will be reciting poetry to make points. You go to the mosques, people are reciting poetry. Everywhere in between, everyone's reciting poetry. And yet there are some people who say, oh, poetry is not very good. Poetry is not un-Islamic. It's a weird argument because it's everywhere. But uh, some people make this argument on the basis of verses in the Quran, or really half a verse in the Quran about the poets, the wandering every valley, they say what they don't do. But people forget to read the verse that comes after that, except for those who remember God much, who do good deeds, remember God much, and help each other when they're wronged. So the Quran describes, defines, they're good poets and they're bad poets. And the good poets are the ones who do lots of dhikr and who do righteous deeds and who help each other after they've been wronged. And the bad poets are the bad poets. Right. Uh, the Prophet والسلام, was not a poet. And he was not a poet because he carried the Quran, which is more poetic than any poetry. It's above poetry. Um, 
But his companions were poets, and he used to tell them to versify against the enemies. So they would have like, like rap battles. And he'd tell Hassan ibn Thabit, that's the Holy Spirit, aid Hassan ibn Thabit, versify against the enemies. And Hassan would write a banger diss track and phew, come up. And the Prophet said it would hit them uh, harder than an arrow. Hitting them would smite them harder, harder than an arrow, like a missile striking them. And this, in, in these days, people would they'd line up for battles. Sometimes and the poets would come out and they'd spit verses at each other. And if someone was beaten too badly, the other side would just go home in shame. It's a much more civilized way of fighting warfare, all these drones and stuff like that. Um, so uh, anyone who has a problem with poetry has a problem with our prophet, has a problem with Islam. So they can just, they, they, they should learn to love poetry. Um, why is poetry so important, though? I mean, we have the Quran. Why do we need anything other, other, other than the Quran? Poetry is really special for a number of reasons. I mean, one reason, obviously, it's, it's the language of love. It's the language of love. Any of you who've fallen in love, you know, all of a sudden the songs on the radio start making a little bit of sense. <laughs> Things that annoyed you before all of a sudden start, start making sense. Also, you might try your hand at poetry a little bit if you fall in love. And one, of, one of the reasons for that is poetry is the language of dhok, uh, of experience. Direct experience, intense experience. A simple reason for this, if you have an experience, a direct experience, right, not something, something that's beyond just conceptual concepts, right, like you taste a juicy guava or passion fruit or something like that, and you want to explain to somebody who's never had passion fruit what it tastes like, what do you have to do? You have to say it's, it's sweet like this, but it's kind of got this funky thing like that. You have to start using similes and metaphors. You have to start speaking poetically. Right, so poetry is a language of direct experience. Our most intense experience as human beings is love. Right, so that's why when we fall in love, when people try to talk about love, it always gets poetic, if not turns to poetry. Right, so poetry is, is, is the language of love. Which is an interesting thing that happened in, uh, in Arabia. They had an amazing poetic tradition, the Mu'alakat, the Jahili poetry. It's, it's incredible. But when the Quran came, what you see happen is the poetic tradition starts shifting and becomes super love-obsessed. It's not that love poetry was completely absent before. It's there, but there was a bit more battle poetry, a bit more bragging. Actually, it's a lot like gangster rap. They talk about how many people they killed, how, many, how bad their camels are, you know, how, literally how they make it rain in, in the tavern, like you know, spill gold coins like this, like falling rain. And, you know, read the Jahli poets, that's, that's what they... And then the, the revelation comes, and you get this big shift, and everybody's writing love poetry. Everybody, that's when you get the Urdhri poetry, that's when you get Layla and Majnoon, that's when you get all of this obsession. Why? Because the Quran is a book of love. And so the Quran comes down, this massive explosion of love, love of God, love of the Prophet, all this stuff, and this massive explosion of poetry, and particularly love poetry, comes out. One of my favorite things that I learned um, was uh, Sukaina bint Hussein, the daughter of Imam Hussein, uh, used to hold poetry salons in Medina. People would come, recite poems, and she'd say, no, you should fix this, and have that verse there, do this or that. Uh, so poetry is a big part of the life of the companions, of the prophet. And he wouldn't write poetry himself, but he'd tell his companions to write poetry. The tabi'in, it's a big part of the Islamic tradition. Anywhere the Quran went, anywhere Islam went, you see this big explosion of poetry. Right? So Persian poetry, which is you know, one of the biggest tra traditions of poetry in the world, Persian language poetry, before Islam came, there's not like much, you would know better than me, but there's not much Sassanid poetry, Avestan poetry, right? But as soon as the Quran comes, woof, you get this explosion of poetry, poetic language. Same that goes to the east coast of Africa, poof, explosion of Swahili poetry, coming to West Africa, Hausa poetry. Again, it's not that poetry wasn't there before, but the Quran intensifies poetic output. And it's kind of the sign of a healthy Muslim community. You've got poets writing good poetry, expressing their love for God, expressing their love now for the Prophet. And one of the secrets of this poetry is something in Arabic called lisan al-hal, the tongue of the state. So, and this is pretty easy to under, understand. Um, you think of like, uh, I don't know, a breakup album, like Beyonce's Lemonade or something like that, or Adele has an album. What she was feeling and going through, she puts in that album. And you go and listen to it and you start feeling kind of the same thing. It's the tongue of the state, that, that song, that poem, those words, the sound carries with it the state that the author was in. 
And it, it can be kind of contagious. It can kind of put you in that state as well, too. And this is true of this kind of poetry. So Imam Busiri wrote the beautiful Borda that we hit. Madly, madly, I mean, he's desperate. He's sick in his bed, madly in love with the prophet, feeling all this regret. And he writes this beautiful poem, uh, you know, which is like crying, tears mixed with blood as they're coming down his cheeks. Very, very intense. And when you recite it, if you're sensitive, you get a little, you get a little contact high. You get a little of the lisan al-hal of what Busiri was going through. All these other amazing poems that we just uh, heard today. And it's the, even if you don't understand the lyrics, just the very sound. Just like how you can listen to a symphony, you can listen to a piece of music, and it'll put you in that state, even if, I mean, it's music, there's no words. Right? And so just the very sounds and the rhythms of poetry um, can do this. Another big secret behind poetry is if we think of, you know, the Quranic image, God says, kun fayakun, God speaks the world into being. Right? God speaks the world into being, so the whole world is words. The whole world, world is words. The words that we speak, because we're made in God's image, we kind of echo that divine speech that creates the world in our ordinary language speech with our breath. Now, God creates everything, as the Quran says, with order, in order. What's ordered speech? Poetry. Poetry is speech that's ordered, that's metered, that has rhythm and rhyme. And so that's why some English language poets say, you know, that's why it's called a universe. It's a universe, it's one verse. The whole world is like a verse of poetry. And so there are these kind of symbolic connections between poetic speech and the actual creation of, of the world. Um, so poetry, going back to this idea of poetry, being able to express direct experiences, things that you can't really say otherwise. It's kind of effing the ineffable. Right, so if you're in love, it's something that transcends ordinary descriptions. How are you going to talk about it? You feel like you can't stay quiet. You have to say something. But anything you say falls short of the actual reality of, of, of the experience. This is loads of Sufi poets have said this. They say, I, I, I'm, I'm, what Shibli said, I'm like a frog that's trapped in the sea. If I open my mouth, I drown. If I keep, <laughs> if I keep it closed, I drown. I have to say something. But anything I say falls short of the reality of the experience of love. So poetry kind of does this. It, it allows you to thread the needle between silence and speech um, because uh, in its very form, it's a barzakh. A barzakh is a liminal reality that unites and separates two seeming opposites. So like sunsets a barzakh between day and night. So it's dawn. The doorway is a barzakh between inside and outside. You know, the, 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 all these things are bar, they both unite and separate. So both poetry is a barzakh between just music and regular prose, between uh, in Arabic, adwak and awraq, between direct experience, tasting, and <coughs> papers, writing things down, discursive expression. It's a um, barzakh between pure thought and feeling. They're, they're combined together all at once in, 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 in good poetry, anyway. And even the structure of poetry has this, right? All traditional Islamic poetry is metered and rhymed. Meter, rhythm, is a barzakh between stillness or eternity and motion or time. Right? It's moving, it's always moving, but it's always staying still. It's always the same. Rhyme is a barzakh between one sound and many sounds. Right? And even us, uh, our breath, poetry, the, the, the like canvas of poetry, the substance of poetry is our breath. Now, breath is a barzakh between body and spirit. And fihi, God breathed into us his spirit. So it's a thing that connects our body with the spirit. That's why we do a lot of breath things. We recite Quran, we breathe things. Um, breath exercises are used in a lot of traditions. So the breath is a barzakh between body and spirit. And so poetry brings together body and spirit. This art of breath brings together uh, body and spirit. And even we as human beings, we're, you know, we're, we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're, we're khulafa, between haq and khalq, between God and his creation, ultimately between being and nothingness, so kind of this in-between state. And so poetry in its very structure kind of mirrors our structure. Uh, it's a barzakh, and it can speak to us at all levels. So poetry, it's, it's a physical art. When you recite a poem, it's not like TV that you watch. Right? If you're reciting the poetry, it's not something passive. It's not like you're looking at a painting or something. The, the canvas is your breathing. It's like it's you. It's your body. So it works on the level of the body. And if you know, poetry is good, you might get goosebumps or things like that. 
It works on the level of uh, ordinary discursive understanding. You have the meanings. It works on the level of the imagination. And if it's good spiritual poetry, or even if it's not, if it's just good poetry, whether it's spiritual or not, if it's good poetry, it goes even beyond that. It touches the heart, touches the spirit, involves the intellect. All levels of our being are involved when we're reciting, when we're reading uh, poetry. Uh, everything from the depths of our soul to the tips of our hair. Another thing poetry does, it's why it's so important. The, the word for poetry, uh, shi'ar, in Arabic, comes from the, uh, the verb, the verbal noun shi'ur, which means a kind of perception, a kind of subtle perception. So poetry allows you to kind of, it's, it's, it creates a sense of awareness of the world, of the connection between things in the world. Oh, it's another barzakh, I forgot, metaphor. Metaphor is a bridge, is a barzakh between the, you could say that the thing described and the, th the thing and the thing it's likened to. So if I say, my brother is a lion, there's a connection between him and the lion, and that connection, that barzakh between him and the lion is the metaphor, is the poetry there. And so seeing those, the awareness of those connections is cultivated through the writing, the reading, the recitation of poetry. It makes you sensitive to these connections, to these subtle connections that connect everything. Because everything that exists is ayatollah, signs of God, reflecting different attributes of God. Because of that, everything's connected. And the perception, the awareness of this is what poets have, is what poets tap into. It's that shu'ur, that awareness of the interconnectedness of everything. And in their poetry, they trace out these subtle connections in Arabic, raqa'iq. And I see another connects back to the meaning of poetry because these subtle connections like these thin filaments connecting everything like hair the word for hair in arabic is shar from the same root as shar poetry All right so poetry is this amazing amazing many splendid thing if you look in most muslim societies there's a lot of poetry a lot of love poetry but especially uh, a lot of love poetry directed towards the prophet muhammad <laughs> particularly in west africa West Africa, that's just about any, anything anybody writes, is, is Madih, Madih poetry. Um, and uh, so why, what's going on when you praise the Prophet? We sang these lovely songs praising the Prophet. Why is this so important? Um, I mean, I remember when I first read some Madih stuff, I was like, okay, I get it. He's wonderful. God loves him. He did all these great things. Well, what's, what's, what's really going on here? Why is, why is this praising the Prophet so, so important? Um, I mean, just from the perspective of just ordinary, uh, just even having iman. Part of faith, the Prophet said, none of you have faith until I'm more beloved to him than in a different, he said this multiple times, different versions, than his father, than his mother, than his children, than his wealth, even than himself. Right? That's pretty extreme. <laughs> That's a high bar for iman, to love somebody more than yourself, who maybe you've never met. Uh, you know, um, so the, but this, this love of the prophet is really important for a bunch of different reasons. Love is the whole, the whole point, <laughs> the, whole, the whole tradition, the, the whole thing started by love. You know, it's a non-canonical hadith, but Ibn Arabi said he verified it via cash. He had a conversation with the prophet, and the prophet said, I didn't say it, but it's true, so <laughs> you, can, you can record it. So it's, it says, I was a kuntu kanzan lam oraf. I was a Treasure, un God says, I was a treasure unrecognized. I was an unrecognized treasure, and I love to be known, so I created the creatures that they might know me. I said, what's the, the reason of creation? It's love. It comes out of love. And who's the one who recognized God the best? Most preferred, it's the Prophet, Sallallahu Who's the best lover of God? It's the Prophet, Sallallahu God loves him, and he loves God. As the, you know, so it starts out with love. As the verse of Surah Maida says, you know, he loves them and they love him. So God's love comes first. God loves us. God brings us into being out of love. And then as a result of that love, uh, God's love for us, we love him back. We have this echo of his love. Our love is just an echo of his love back to him. And so that's why in uh, Surah Al-Mran, the prophet said, God says to the prophet, say, if you love God, we all love God, whether we're aware of it or not. We all, everything that we're chasing around, looking for, that we love, that we're desiring, it's just God in that, that, that was, we're just seeing the reflection of God's beauty in whatever it is that we're chasing after and, and loving. 
So it says to the prophet, if you love God, being people, which is all of you people, because if you love, you're loving God, whether you realize it or not, then follow me. Right? Then follow the prophet, because how do you know how to get back to your beloved? How do you not, not confuse your beloved with his reflection in something? You don't want to end up kissing your beloved's reflection on a mirror. You look pretty stupid. You want to be able to turn around from the mirror and go back to the actual beloved. So if you love God, then follow me, and God will love you. All right. And if God loves you, you go to the Hadith Nawafu. My servant keeps approaching me through this, what I've made obligatory on him. Then he keeps approaching me through these supererogatory, these extra acts of devotion, which the Prophet did. So you keep following the Prophet through this more and more intensely until or so that hatta, I love him. When I love him, I'm his hand by which he grasps, his foot by which he walks, his ear, hearing by which he hears, his sight by which... You can't get any more intimate than that. That's the... That's the you know, anytime you have love, you want union with the thing. Even if you're a fat kid who loves cake, you want, to, you want union with the cake. Right? If you, if you love God, you want to be with God. If you love the prophet, you want to be with the prophet. So you follow the prophet, way of getting close to the prophet, in order to get close to God. And when you keep this, when this virtuous cycle of love keeps going and going around, it gets to the point where all of a sudden God is your hand, your foot, your hearing, your seeing. You can't, get any, you can't even get that close with another person. It's closer than your jugular vein. You get that close um, with God through love, through following the prophet. So it's all through love. Love through love of God, through love of the prophet, which are ultimately the same thing. Because what we love in the prophet, the prophet's God's beloved. So we love, we love him for, for two reasons. We love him, one, because God loves him. And we love him, two, because what we see in him, that we love all of the fine characteristics, the way he was when people would throw uh, literally crap on him, would do all these things, the beautiful character that he responded with, that's all a reflection of the divine names and attributes. Most perfect reflection of divine names and attributes was in the Prophet ﷺ. So he's the most perfect mirror of God. You can't look directly at God. This is like looking at the sun. It'll blind you. But you can look at the Prophet ﷺ. You can look at the Prophet and you can see and understand the divine names and attributes in the mirror of the Prophet, the most perfect. And this is why some people get confused. It's like, why do you spend all your time praising the Prophet? Why aren't you praising God? You're praising the Prophet more than God? No, in praising the Prophet, we're praising God. Praising the Prophet, we're praising God. And we're praising God as he likes to be praised. Because he said, you know, as we recited at the beginning, in Allahu malaikatu yusalun ali nabi, ya ayyuha ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallam wa tassalam. Oh, God and his angels pray upon. It's literally, we, we say invoke blessings, but sallu. It's the same verb to pray, to invoke blessings, to pour out blessings on the Prophet. Oh, you who believe. It's the one thing that we, um, it's like the act of worship that we share with God. Right? It's not like God doesn't make hajj in that, that way. You know? It's not like God gives zakat in that way. Right? But invoking blessings on the Prophet, God and his angels do it, and we do it too with him. And this invoking blessings is an integral part <laughs> of the tradition of praise poetry. It's all found in all of the poems are often just versified forms of invoking blessings and prayers on, 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 on the prophet. Um, now this, this praise is also another uh, important aspect to it, uh, which for me, when I, when I learned this, I was like, oh, that's why the prophet is called Muhammad. Because I always wondered, like, all the names, Muhammad, Ahmed, because in, in English, you think of praise, you just think of flattery. Right, like, oh, this guy's so great, all this. But praise has a much deeper connotation, in especially Quranic Arabic. So um, some scholars, Ibn Arabi, Mullah Sadra, and others have explained that what praise means is to make positive attributes manifest. Right? So he, he's sitting here praising me. I, I, I mean, he might have been lying a bit, exaggerating, but he's making positive attributes manifest. And so all of God's creation is him making his signs, his, his positive attributes, his attributes manifest, and all of his attributes are positive. So all of existence is praise. Right, so the Quran says, Everything hymns his praise. So everything is praise, 
It's God's praise of himself. It's God making his attributes manifest. And everything also is a praiser. Everything praises God. So everything is praise and everything praises God. Now praise, you can, the, the best praise is the one that will have the best praiser, the best form of praise, and the best praised. Right? So if, if he's praising me, he's, mashallah, a very wonderful person, so that elevates the rank of praise. If he's praising me very eloquently, that elevates it even more. But he's praising me, so it's, you know, if you wrote a praise poem for Donald Trump, that takes the air out of the, out of the praise, right? Even if it's written very eloquently. All right. So the Prophet Muhammad, uh, scholars say, unites the best praise, praiser, God, because the Prophet Muhammad is the most perfect khair uh, al he's the best uh, existent, existing thing, the one in whom God's attributes are most clearly manifest. So he's the best form of praise. He's God's most highest form of praise for himself. And he unites the best praiser, God, with the best form of praise, his very being, um, and the best praised, which is God himself again. So that's why it's called Muhammad, the praised one, the, and the intensely praised, and Ahmed, the most praised, because he's the pinnacle, the summit of praise. And praise is just existence. All of existence is praise. And if all of existence is a poem, all of existence is a praise poem. So in writing, reciting praise poetry, we're kind of echoing the cosmic act of God. So basically, all of existence is God's praise poem for himself. And the Prophet Muhammad is the, the crown jewel of that praise. And so when we write praise poetry, when we sing praise poetry for the Prophet, we're participating in that, in that cycle. Just like when we if you invoke Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammad, they're participating in God's the kind of flood, the outpouring, the waterfall, blessings on God, on the Prophet, and then from the Prophet down to everything else that keeps the world in existence, ultimately. Um, so it's a form of participating in the divine activity of praise that we're doing. And this is why it's so, so important in Muslim societies. And that's why you find where there's healthy spirituality, there'll be a lot of poetry. So it's like a Nigerian proverb, that, uh, a village without music is dead. Right? A Muslim, view, uh, Muslim village without madih is dead. And this, this praise poetry makes you love the Prophet, alayhi Makes you love him. I mean, one, because it's just beautiful and it just attracts your heart and it's fun to sing and it's fun to listen to and it brings you joy. And that joy is then attached to the idea of the Prophet. But then it also, uh, again, this praise is making positive attributes manifest. It makes clear to you and makes present to you, particularly those that were very far from the Prophet's time in some ways and very far from him in this way or that way, or we seem to be. He's not far from us, but we're far from him. Uh, it brings that to our minds. It makes it apparent, makes it manifest to us, both his khuluk and his khalq, his appearance. So this amazing thing about praise poetry is it'll always go back and forth between historical events, things that he did, his appearance, the way he treated other people, where he's from, all of this stuff, and his spiritual qualities. And it brings them together. So whereas like uh, salawat literature, like Allah Masliyallah, it tends to focus just on the spiritual aspect of the Prophet, and the sirah tends to focus on the, the historical aspect of the Prophet. Madih poetry, again, poetry is the synthetic barzakhi thing, tends to bring the spiritual and the physical together in this whole totality. So you get a real sense of the totality of the person of the Prophet, both the loftiest spiritual heights that transcend anything we could ever imagine, as well as, oh, he would patch his own clothes. And things like that. So we get an amazing, and uh, we can imagine the prophet. The poetry is one way in which poetry works, called tahiyyah, it creates an imaginal image in, in, in your mind. And it's beautiful. The verses are beautiful. The one being described is beautiful. And where there's beauty, there's always love. And so it produces love and devotion and attachment to, 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 to the person of the prophet, uh, which is, that's the engine that drives the whole spiritual path, that drives all of life that drives us to be better people, that drives us to God. Um, and so, so poetry is like a, um, you know, if you're working out, you put on music, it gets easier to work out. Madih poetry is like that. You're struggling on the spiritual path, you're trying to do well, you're trying to find the motivation, listen to some madih, recite some madih. It's like, like what music does for you at the gym. It gets you going. It starts your engine. 
It's really powerful. It's the wind, it can be the wind under your wings. Um, and especially in times like this with everything going on, we could all use a bit of support. And Medih poetry is more than just uh, a bit of support. Um, now this, this state that, that we're trying to get to, the state of being beloved where God becomes a hand, a foot, things like that, that's the state of the prophet. That's the state, I mean, who, who has, who's closer to God than the prophet? Um, and so there's a lot of this poetry, I can think of like 10 different collections of Medih poetry that are titled Taysir al-Wasul ila Hadrat Rasul, facilitating the arrival at the presence of the prophet, because that's what it does, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The poetry, you can say, it brings down his presence, it creates his presence in the mind, it brings you into his presence, makes you aware of his presence. Uh, this poetry is incredibly effective um, at doing that. So a lot of West African shiyukh, uh, and not just West African shiyukh, a lot of shiyukh um, have said that the writing of praise poetry was, if not just their suluk, but an important part of their suluk, of their spiritual journey. So Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba, famous uh, Sheikh in, in, in Senegal, who French in prison for years and led anti-colonial resistance against them. Really incredible Sheikh. Um, he said, I began to travel the path of the people, of the Sufis, the moment I began to write his praises. And he wrote, I don't know, I think, I think he wrote over 500 poems in praise of the Prophet. Some of them are like 30 pages long. Um, uh, Sheikh Bram Yas uh, was uh, probably the, the most prolific and influential uh, poet of this tradition in West Africa, said that his poetry in praise of the Prophet is Thamrat al qata Hayati. It's the fruit of all the moments of my life. He said, it's my weapons, it's my fortress, it's my inheritance, it's my traces. If you're looking to know me, look into my praise poetry. And in his poetry, he describes, he said, I'll be up all night while everybody's sleeping, mixing my ink with tears, writing for my beloved, so it was an integral part. He would recite the Qur'an, every, the, he'd finish reciting the Qur'an every week, but in addition to this incredible reciting the Qur'an every week, doing lots of adhkar, composing Medih poetry, reciting Medih poetry is an important part of his spiritual practice. Sheikh Saleh Jafari in Azhar University as well, the composition of beautiful poems in praise of the Prophet. He said, this is, this is suluki, this is my method of connecting with, with, with the Prophet and of connecting with God. Uh, so this is a really, really important part uh, of our tradition. Uh, leaving it out, you're missing out on a lot. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful tradition. So what I want to do um, is having said those few words about it, I think, uh, more than a few stuff for last, is to stop talking about it and actually taste it. So I wanted to sing this. Uh, one of my favorite ones is from this Mauret contemporary Mauritanian sheikh. Very simple little one, Hubu Taha. And you have the, on the handout, you have the translation there. Um, and the melody is really simple. It's just, Hubbu uh, Taha Yusta Tabu. And then the chorus is, Allah, 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 Habba Dha Kal Janabu. Allah, 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 Hubbu Taha Yusta Tabu. Allah, 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 Habba Dha Kal Janabu. Allah, Allah, Allah. Fahua Dukrun Lil Baraya, Allah, 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 Wahua Lil Khairati Babu, Allah, 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 Wahua Amnun Wa Amanun, Allah, 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 Wata Amun Wa Sharabu, Allah, 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 Wahua Durun Wahua Kenzun, Allah, 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 Wahua Lubun Wa Lubabu, Allah, Allah, Allah. Inna ardan laysa fiha Allah 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 Hubbu taha la yababu Allah 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 Wa quluban laysa fiha Allah 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 Hubbu taha la kharabu Allah 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 Falyakun fi kulli qalbin Allah 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 Min hawa taha nisabu Allah 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 Fahuwa ruqyun lil nafsi haqan Allah 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 Wa dua'un mustajabu Allah 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 La tumilkum anhu mayun Allah 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 Aulu babun awra babu Allah 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 La tubalu bina'imin Allah 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 
duna dhaqa aw iqabu Allah 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 Hubbu taha yustatabu Allah 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 Habba dha dhaka aljanabu Allah 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 Hubbu taha yustatabu Allah 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 Habba dha dhaka aljanabu Allah 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 Falyakun fi kulli qalbin Allah 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 Min hawa taha nisabu Allah 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 Falyakun fi kulli qalbin Allah 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 Min hawa taha nisabu Allah 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 Very simple, but it can go on for hours and hours and hours doing that. And so when you're doing this, you're, invo- you're doing dhikr, you're invoking Allah, you're praising the Prophet, and there's some really profound stuff, you know, it's just like a nice catchy thing, but some really profound stuff uh, in here. So, you know, loving Taha is delightful. Often we can think of the spiritual path and these things as a heavy burden, as something that's difficult. But I think that's the wrong perspective to take. It, it can be difficult, but it's actually quite delightful if you have the right approach to it. Just like being in love, being in love can be really hard. It's not just like it is the same. Being in love is, is, is really hard. It can be really hard. You have to make sacrifices. Your ego dies. You get up. If you have kids, you love them. You got to get up and change diapers. You have a spouse or significant other, you love them. You have to sacrifice all kinds of things. Now, okay, we'll go to the restaurant you like. We'll watch a movie you like. It's, it's an ego death all the time. But it's delightful. It's really, it's really delightful. What you get is so much more than what you let go of. What you let go of is nothing. What you get is everything. Um, and why is it so delightful? Because the one, our beloved, is so lovely. Uh, he's the treasure of creation, um, so, and, and to all goodness a doorway. So the, everything in creation is kind of, all the goodness in creation is contained and summarized in the Prophet. Okay, so that's any fine quality that anybody has anywhere at any time, you'll find it in the Prophet. Any beauty that's out there in the world existing, anywhere, Grand Canyon, Puget Sound, what have you, you'll find in the Prophet. So he's the treasure that contains all the beauties of creation. And as a result of that, to all goodness, he's a doorway. Goodness in this world, goodness in the next world. He's peace and he's our protection. So in the presence of the Prophet, there's peace and there's protection from all kinds of spiritual, even physical maladies, ailments, and, 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 and things like that. And he's food and our refreshment. He's a Prophet of food. I mean, it's not like we take communion and, you know, some, something like that. But he's, his, his, uh, his, his presence, his words, his, our, our love for him is what sustains us spiritually. That's what keep, food is what keeps you going. You eat it, it becomes part of you, and it keeps you going. Um, he's a pearl and he's a treasure. Uh, there's a lot going on with this, the, with this pearl thing. Anyway, there's a technical Sufi term, the white pearl, which is like the first thing that emerges from the, the ama, the cloud. Um, but basically, you can think of it, that you, you look at a pearl, it contains, if you look at it, if you put a pearl like in the center of this room, if you look at it, you can see the entire room in it, right? Because it's reflective, it's beautiful. Every, everything that's in this room, if you were to put a pearl exactly in the center of the room, you can see it reflected in it. And so the prophet's like that. Everything in the whole universe, all the beauties are contained in him. And he's a treasure. We talked about he's the greatest treasure. And he's the kernel and he's the quintessence. Again, so the, the very kernel, the very quintessence of what everything, uh, really of everything, what everything is. Um, so you guys know, know the idea of uh, Buddha nature. Right? As Buddhists have this idea, within everything is kind of Buddha nature. Within everything is, because everything in a certain sense is created from the light of the prophet. So within everything is the reality of the, of the prophet. So he's the kernel and quintessence of everything that is. And a land without love of Taha is a wasteland so forsaken. I think it's obvious. And hearts without love of Taha are ruins wrecked and desolated. Right? But lest you think this is like, oh, okay, it's like if, if, you're, if you're not Muslim, if you're not singing Medih poetry, forget it. He says, no, no, in each and every heart is a portion of Taha's passion. It could be love for Taha, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> Everybody's got love for the Prophet, But also, you know, min uh, hawa Taha can be uh, love for Taha, love for Taha, or it can be Taha's love. And so ta- the Prophet's love is present within each of us. 
flowing through us. Uh, he's the soul's enchantment, truly. Um, ruqya. ruqya can also be like charm, you know, recite ruqya to clear out jinn and things like that. If the prophet comes in, all the bad things disperse, but also it's, it means enchantment in both senses, delightful. Uh, and he is the answered prayer. And there are all of these, I mean, the prophet is literally the answered prayer of creation for the presence of God to, to be manifest in this way. Uh, but also, the, on a more practical level, all of these traditions about, you say, your prayers are suspended between heaven and earth until you invoke blessings on the prophet, and then they, then they get there. Uh, and so if you have a love like this, no beloved can distract you from him. Um, no pretty girl, no fine boy, no even any instruments, because every, all the beauties that are in those things are in him to an even greater degree. And so without that, uh, I don't care at all for any blessing or torment. So if you've got this kind of strong relationship of love with the prophet, torment, blessings, you don't care about. It's another, uh, one of my favorite verses of poetry. It wasn't written as a, a spiritual verse of poetry, but uh, the Sufis took it up because they were like, oh, this expresses exactly what we're talking about. It's by uh, Abu Faras Hamadani, I think. It says, فَلَيْتَكَ تَحْلُوا وَالْحَيَاتُ مَرِيرَةٌ وَلَيْتَكَ تَرْضَى فَالْأَنَامُ غِضَابٌ وَلَيْتَ لَذِي بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكَ الْعَمْرِ وَبَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ الْعَالَمِ الْخَرَابِ إِذَا صَحْ مِنْكَ وَدُّوا فَكُلُّ حِينٍ وَكُلُّ مَا فَوْكَ تُرَابٌ تُرَابٌ وَكُلُّ الَّذِي فَوْكَ تُرَابٌ تُرَابٌ So it's, it's uh, as long as you're sweet, let life be bitter. As long as you're pleased with me, let everybody be mad at me. Uh, as long as there's between you and me a bond, let everything between me and the rest of the world be in ruins. If you're happy with me, then everything's easy. And let whatever's over the dust be dust. Right? It's beautiful. You have that kind of love and relationship with the Prophet, life's easy. <laughs> Even when it's hard. Because all you care about is your love. For him. I don't know if you ever felt that way about another person. You really love them. Even if everything's terrible all around, you got each other. And you love each other. And that makes everything good. And that makes everything all right. And that's what we have on God's side, on the prophet's side towards us. We just have to turn around and pick up our part with that. So that's what's going on in this cute little poem that I love so much. Um, the next one I wanted to read uh, is by Sheikh Bram Yass, uh, Another amazing, I mentioned an amazing Senegalese Sheikh. Uh, he... <laughs> He called this the poem of the one who lost his mind. He loved reciting this. He said he wrote it when he was in a state of intense love uh, for, for the prophet and have people um, recite it. And you'll see why. Um, so this one, I think that reciting it, I mean, you can try it if you want, but the easy part is the, the chorus, which is just, Allahu Allah Allah Muhammad Rasulullah 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 Okay so I'll just I'll recite a verse and then we can do the, the chorus Okay Bismillah Allahu Allah Allah Muhammad Rasulullah Hawa al-Mustafa al-Mukhtari Khalata mudmari Wa kulli wa juzzi Fahwa siri wa mahdari Allahu Allah Allah Muhammad Rasulullah Iza da'a dawu al-Badri Miltu li dhikrihi Wa adhkuruhu fi kurli marran Wa manzari Allahu Allah Allah Muhammad Rasulullah Wa adhkuruhu Inda al-Aghani Wa idh hala madha Mukandari Allahu Allah Allah Muhammad Rasulullah Walastu ara mustahsanan ghayra wajhihi fa laysa jamalun ghayra wajhi mudathiri Allahu Allah Allah Muhammad Rasulullah Wa ana aini wa illa fa mawti fi shawkan li unsiri Allahu Allah Allah Muhammad Rasulullah Wa law la tidadu fi aljanani bi nurihi lamahanana Allahu Allah, Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah 
that. I love you so much, I want to be in this mouth. I want to be his toothbrush. If only I could be for a sip of his water. Or I could be the cup bearer for the moon I share his cup bearer. So I console myself with the hope of union. So perhaps he'll grant union to his free slave. A blessing, so that's upon Yasin, Taha, Muhammad, all the names, with his family and companions all together without exception. That, that's what love looks like. That's love. love is not just obedience, not love is not just, okay, I'm gonna wear my pants to some of like, I'm gonna say the right Arabic stuff or something. That's, that's love. That's what loving the Prophet looks like. And one of the amazing, Medih poetry really shows you like what love for the Prophet really looks like beyond just uh, what we think of today as just like piety, doing the right motions, things like that. You can't fake, you can't fake love. And when you see Medih poetry like Sheikh Brahim's, like Mambu Siri's, like Sheikh Shahudi's, when you see these people who are literally madly in love with the Prophet, you see what that really means. And that's just what Iman is. To have Iman is to, for the, to love the Prophet more dearly than you love yourself. That's what it means to be a mu'min. That's what it means to be a believer. Um, and so when you read these poems, you get a sense of, oh, that's what, okay. That's what it's like. That's why all these Sufi shiuch would tell, like Jami would tell people, they came to him, he would be like, have you fallen in love yet? And they said, no, it's like, go fall in love, then come back. Then you're ready. Because the path is all about yeah, it's, it's all about this kind of love, about falling in love. Um, and Smidih poetry helps us do it. Alhamdulillah. God bless you. Barakallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Shall we do a Q&A? Yeah, yeah, sure. Perhaps if anyone has any questions, we could do a Q&A session to benefit, bring out even more pearls from this ocean. It's a puddle. <laughs> There's a, a stunned silence reigns in the room. Uh, I know two different versions of that. What, why don't you tell me the end of the one? I, I don't remember the end. Oh, okay. I need to, I need to know this. All right. Um, well, I, so I don't know. So one, one thing is um, the uh, one version of something that sounds similar to that is um, th this is something where after the prophet said it, his companion said, we were never more happy than after we heard this. And he said, and... They, they uh, were out talking to the Prophet about where people would be on the Day of Judgment. And the Prophet said, a man will be with the one he loves. So you say, you'll be with the one you love. And he said, really? And he said, we love you, Ya Rasulullah. He said, yes. And so they said that made them happier than anything that he had ever said before. The people were literally dancing out of joy. Because they say, well, I don't know if I'm good, or bad. I don't know if I've done this, but I know I love you. And so that's so why a lot of the, um, the, the it's, I mean, it's, in, it's in some of the poetry as well, too, but a lot of the praise writings introducing these poetic collections, the shiikh will recite, will recite this hadith about al-mar ma man ahabba. The, the, a man will be with the one he loves in, in the next life. And they'll say, you know, I can't, rely on my good deeds, I can't rely on my fasts, I can't rely on this, I can't, but I know I love this man. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the one I know about where, where you'll be. And there are others about uh, those who remember the Prophet most will be the closest to him and this, and those who love the Prophet most will be the closest to him. And um, the other things, um, actually, I don't know if this is properly sahih hadith, but narrations about, you know how they talk about, you can see God like a full moon on the, in the, or the, in the, there's a hadith about how we see God, and the prophet's like, can, can you all see the full moon here from your different places, even though in your different places, uh, God's like that. Um, but the other Sufi sayings that say the prophet's like the, the full moon, everybody can see him. 
the day of judgment. And then there are all these wonderful ahadith, again, speaking about praise, in which the Prophet comes um, and intercedes for everybody. So he's under the banner of praise, liwa alhamd, and God teaches him praises that nobody's ever heard before. And he praises God with these praises. And because of the praise, he is allowed to intercede for people. So they, they describe the, the crush, the rush of the chaos of the Day of Judgment. And everybody's gathered under the Prophet, who's under the banner of praise, who's praising God. And as a result of the, the, the praise comes up, the blessings come down. And he can intercede for all of those uh, around him, for his community and even beyond, as a result of his praise of, of, of God. So there's lots of stuff about the Day of Judgment, and, but it's, a lot of it is connected to love and praise. So you want to be close to the Prophet? Love the Prophet. Be close to him spiritually in your heart, and you'll be close to him. So I'm really deep in your heart, and because the Akhirah is not like, in, in some sense, it's not like after, after. In a certain sense, it's kind of above. Now, by now, exactly, now. It's kind of above us right now. We're just not necessarily aware of it. But on that day, the Quran says, your sight's hadid, it's piercing. You see, you're not distracted by whatever, Netflix and job and things like that. So your sight's piercing. You can see what's really going on. So you can really perceive your state of closeness with the Prophet. And Sheikh Ibrahim had this one wonderful little conversation where he had a conversation with himself. And he asked himself, he's like, oh, have you seen the Prophet? Um, and he said, well, if I've seen him or if I haven't seen him, there's no way I could love him anymore. If I saw him or if I didn't see him, it wouldn't make any difference to how much I love him. I love him so much, it wouldn't make any difference if I saw him or I didn't see him. That's the state of love I'm in right now. So, yeah, those are the few things I know. I'd have to look up the particular reference to that one, but that's, that's what comes to mind. Thanks. Um, so, the love, love of the Prophet as an end in itself or as a conduit to how you're supposed to love all of creation, how you're supposed to treat your community or your fellow man. Or, um, my understanding is that it's not just an end in itself, that, it's, that through that love, you're, you're supposed to be transformed into, into his character, the way that he treated people, the way that he was with his community and, and um, society. Is that, is that the point of the love or? or now that, that, I mean, you, you can say that, but the point, why do you do all those things? Why are you nice to your society? That's not the end in itself. If you do those things, you do it out of love. Mm -hmm. right, so, or put it this way, this is um, this is a poem that says, the, the two worlds are seeking God, God seeking and loving Muhammad. Right, so if you love God, you'll love God's beloved. So you're doing things, fisa bilillah, you're doing things for the love of God. The one you're doing it for is doing things for the love of the Prophet. Okay, so that's, so it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's not like, oh, yeah, I, I, I love my wife, but I really, wife, I love you because I want to be an upstanding member of my community and having a good wife and loving her properly makes me an upstanding. No, no, that's not, that's self-love. No, I'm not saying that, that you're doing it for that reason, but you're, through the love, you're understanding what love is. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I, I wouldn't, uh, love is, at least in this tradition, is not instrumental. It's the motivating factor behind all the things you do, and it's, it's, the origin of, it's the origin of sincere action. If you're doing something for a reason other than love, it's insincere. It's like a very, it was a rumor your heart is that see all foundations except for love's own cracked. They're shaky. Right? Doing anything for a reason other than love is mixed motives. Is love, love is a kind of identical with sincerity of intention. And in an amal biniyat, actions are judged by their intention. So you're doing something out of love, you're doing it with sincere intention, you're doing the actions correctly. Um, so yes, of course, loving the Prophet will, um, but I don't think you can love the Prophet and then be like a jerk <laughs> to people. Right? That's, that's not, part of loving the Prophet is trying to get close to him, to do things that please him, to do things that are like him. Right? You know, so it'd be weird if I love my wife and then I'm rude to her family. That won't work well. Right, so if you love the Prophet, you'll 
love his family, you'll love those he loves. Just like if you love God, you'll love those who God loves. Um, so I think, of it, I think of love for the prophet as including all of that, not necessarily as being a means to those things, because I don't see like uh, being a good community member as the end goal. You're a good community member because that's what pleases God and his prophet, because that's what gets you closer to God and his prophet. That's, so those things, uh, all of those actions I see as uh, those are things that are done out of love for the prophet. You don't love the prophet in order for, for those things. So I, I think, see the love of the prophet as not being instrumental, but as including all of those good things that we're talking about. And love of God, including love of the prophet, and obviously love of the prophet, including love of God. You can't have one without the other. That's the way I see it, anyway. There's a question in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there much tradition in like, West African Middle East poetry of non-Arabic poetry? And yeah. Did you um, I don't know a lot of the non-Arabic stuff, unfortunately, but yeah, there's loads of it. There's loads in Wolof, there's loads in Hausa, there's some in Yoruba, but I've mainly worked on the Arabic stuff, so that's what I know. Uh, if I had some in front of me, I could, I could read the Yoruba stuff to you, but I haven't memorized the, the, a lot of the Yoruba poetry or the Wolof or the Hausa or the Bamana. Hmm? What's that look like on YouTube to find something there? In Wolof, um, if you look up uh, anything by Musa Ka, M-U-S-A-K-A, or actually you could just look, if you, this is kind of, if you look up Zikr Bunech, which means like really nice zikr in Wolof. Uh, a lot of that will be Wolof uh, Medih. Um, Hausa as well, if you look up Zikri Hausa, H-A-U-S-A, there's lots of stuff. Half of that will be Medih. Um, I don't know of any Yoruba stuff. Um, I just know the Arabic stuff that Yoruba people do. I don't know of any Yoruba Zikri. Actually, yeah, if you look up Yoruba Zikri, Y O R. Y O R U B A and Zikri, Z I K R I, you'll get some of that. Um, there's a huge tradition, massive tradition of Swahili poetry in praise of the Prophet. There's Amazigh, Berber poetry in praise of the Prophet. There's Tamashek, Tuareg language poetry. There's Soninke poetry in praise of the Prophet. There's Bamana poetry in praise of the Prophet. Mandinka poetry in praise of the Prophet. Um, most of these West African languages, oh, Fulfude, massive, massive Fulfude tradition, poetry, and praise of the prophet. A lot of these, these, most West African languages, East African, Swahili coast languages, Saharan languages have traditions of Medih poetry that are really awesome. Unfortunately, I would have to get one of my friends uh, to, to recite it for you. So I'm, I'm weak in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to be totally honest. I am struggling a little bit with some of the stuff you're saying. Yeah. Um, because it does kind of feel to me like we are going down the path of kind of assigning the beloved to a station that's quite close to that of the creator of the universe. And um, I'm thinking of like a lot of the Persian poets that you mm -hmm. probably know better than I do. Um, but my understanding is that they're, they're diving into this super complex concept of creation and that they are um, trying to be in love with God, mm -hmm. not with the prophet, just to be upon him as well. So I understand that he is a, um, obviously he's our beloved, right? Everyone here is presumably Muslim or at least understands that. Um, but like when I'm standing in Salah, like in Namaz, in Salah, I'm not thinking about our beloved prophet, even though I'm like I'm Shia, I'm saying Salah constantly, right? Yeah. Especially as a Shia. But like, my goal of standing there is I'm sort of like... You're standing like, before God. For God. Yep. Not, not for Hazrat Isa, not for Hazrat Musa, not, uh -uh, not even for Hazrat Muhammad, you know, peace be upon his family. Um, so for someone like me, because I'm sure you've confirmed yeah, yeah. this before, Give me, give me something. All right, so let's. All right, inshallah. <laughs> so, um, Imam Busiri has a beautiful verse in the Borda. He says, Leave aside what the Christians have said about their prophet, that he's God. Otherwise, praise him however you want. As long as you don't say he's God, any, any other way of praising him, you can't praise him high enough. So, there's a big theme in Medih poetry because of the 
incredibly high station of, oh, but there's another hadith of, um, what's that typical, a narration in which the, the four Khulafai Rashidun meet Uwais Qarni, and he asked him, have you seen the Prophet? Uh, you know this one? No, but you I know, know the name. You know, okay, right? So this person who was a companion who never actually physically met the Prophet, but had this profound spiritual connection with him. So the, each one of them go and they say, yeah, I saw the, I, I, of course I've met the Prophet. You know, I was his co close companion, one of his closest companions. And he said, describe him to me. Oisa Khan, he said, describe him. They said, describe his physical, he looked like this, his character was like this. He said, you didn't meet the Prophet. Until it came to Imam Ali. Imam Ali said, I saw him once. I said, what do you mean you saw him once? He said, between his, between his navel and, his, and his, his chest, there was like this vast expanse of space and universe. And Oisa said, yeah, yeah, you saw him because you saw his spiritual reality, right? So because of the loftiness of his spiritual reality, what they call Hakikatul Muhammadiyah, or Nur Muhammadiyah, the light of, of Muhammad, right? because of how lofty that station is, that closeness is to God, it's not identical to the Creator, that's why I say it's not God, but it's the clearest reflection of God. In these other hadith, it's the first thing that God created was the light of the Prophet, the Hakikatul Muhammadiyah, the pen, the aql, the this, that, the other, all these different names for the spiritual reality, which is most fully manifest in the person of, of, the, of, of the Prophet. Sahih hadith, you can, in both Shia collections and, and Sunni collections. Um, actually, even more of them in Shia collections. Uh, then, um, so, because of this high, lofty spiritual station of the Prophet, you can say anything you want, as long as you don't call him God. Right, so when you're standing in prayer, you're standing in prayer before God, but everything you're doing is what the Prophet did. Absolutely everything you're doing is in imitation of, of the Prophet. Did. You're standing as the Prophet said, you're bowing as he bowed, you're saying the things he said, you're doing, you can't get closer to him than that. So you're standing before God, but you're standing with the Prophet. Right? Well, it's almost as if he's, you know how they say the angels pray behind us? Right, the angels pray behind us, but it's like you're, you're taking on the form of the prophet. There's even some cool things in these symbolic things. When, when you pray, you spell out in the different body positions, you spell out the name Ahmed. Standing, Ha, Mim, Dal. You know, right? you're, you're literally filling out the form of the prophet. Right? In a certain sense, you're taking him as your imam in prayer. He's the one you're following, even if you're at the front. Right? So the way in which you're connecting to God is through the Prophet. Like he said, no one meets God unless he's first met his Prophet. Right? The way you're connecting to God is through, by following in the footsteps of the Prophet. If you love God, then follow me. You never leave following the Prophet. You're always in the Prophet's footsteps. It's easy for me to accept those words because I'm a Muslim convert. But my understanding, and it comes from Surah Al-Baqarah, is that you don't have to be a Muslim to be close to God or to follow God. You don't. That's, that's a concept I just don't accept. That, that you don't have to be a Muslim. Mm -hmm. in, the, in which sense of Muslim? Because Muslim, Muslim in the Quran is, uh, yeah, you know, Abraham's a Muslim, right. Sayyidina Isa is a Muslim. Before our prophet, you yeah. say they were Muslims, right? Yeah. Um, but let's say you're following one of the earlier prophets, like you're mm -hmm. a Jew. You're not doing it in the Mohammedan way, but I mean, frankly, your people have been around a lot longer, and they've been doing it a certain way, and they've mm -hmm. chosen people, and God made a covenant with those people. Right. How can we sit here and say that they need to be doing salah like we are? You know, that just doesn't what the the light of guidance that was in Sayyidina Musa is the same light of guidance that was in Sayyidina Isa. It's the same light of guidance. It's the same Nur Muhammadi. It's the same prophetic reality that's manifest in each of the prophets. Yeah that's manifest in each of the shara'i, that's manifest in each of the laws that was given to them. So that's what I was saying, within each and, within each and every heart is a presence of Taha's passion. Right? So like Rumi says, when you have the name Ahmed, you have the name of all the prophets. Right? The, the, the prof, the particularly when we're talking about this Hakikat al-Muhammadiyah, the spiritual reality, it's, for us it's most fully manifest in the person of Muhammad ibn Abdullah, right? the historical person. Muhammad, but that same light, that same reality of, of guidance, of, of mercy, is the same thing that's manifest in. That's what the Quran simply says. Everybody came confirming that what's come before them. It's the same light of guidance that comes to different people at different times. Just that's, I, to me, I'm hearing a more inclusive and different message. 
It's the, I, for me, I'm saying the same thing. It's if, you, if, you under, if you only understand the, the Prophet as a historical Muhammad ibn Abdullah uh, and don't listen to what he said uh, in the Quran or Hadith, then yes, you could be like, oh yeah, anybody who doesn't have any love of Muhammad ibn Abdullah, forget it. Most people don't know who he is. Most people don't know who he is. Even most Muslims don't know who he is. I, I, would, I don't know if anyone sitting here at least would have thought that you were referencing all of the beloved prophets before the Prophet Muhammad so a lot more Oh. Said that. Like, I would be surprised. That was the, in each and every heart is a portion of Taha's passion, a portion of Taha for passion. Everybody has love for Taha, whether they realize it or not. That's the, that's, that's the understanding, in, in, at least in uh, particularly the more esoteric Medih tradition stuff that will focus, like I said, it goes back and forth between the Hakikat al-Muhammadiyah, the Muhammadan reality, this kind of Logos-like figure, Right? and its historical manifestation, which is understood to reach its fullness in Muhammad ibn Abdullah as the last prophet, the seal of the prophets. But it's the same light, it's the same reality that animated, that flowed through all the other prophets. The same light of guidance. It's just that hakika is, that light is most fully manifest, the last uh, full kind of instantiation of it is in Muhammad ibn Abdullah. So that's, that's if, you, if you want more information on this, I can direct you to some books that will explain this kind of super esoteric prophetology and how it works or if it doesn't. But that's, that's the best I can do for right now. Wa alaikum salam. When the Christians praise like Isa, they are essentially praising the same qualities that are also present in the prophet. Mm -hmm. And so, regardless of whether or not you acknowledge it that way, it's like how we believe. You know, everybody was born Muslim, right? They then, as they get older, are taught other ideology, but fundamentally, they're like roof. That roof is like consistent amongst. Yeah, people. it doesn't mean that if you leave a baby alone, he's going to turn towards Mecca and start yeah. going to right. You know, that's that's not yeah. Same yeah. same kind of idea. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's other like cosmological and metaphysical dimensions to it, but yeah, it, basically. It sounds to me like love for a Nabiyat, not just one Nabi. Yes, but there's our Nabi. Everybody has a, a Qibla, a direction that, they, that you turn to. You can't escape. There's no like no Qibla direction. But even, even like a devout Jewish person would not say that they have to dedicate their, their thought and their life to Hazrat and Musa, for example. Yeah, it's... Focus it, on God, the creator of the universe, the creator of the prophets. The way, the way that... One of the ways we focus on God is focusing on the prophet. This Focusing on God and focusing on the prophet are not two separate things. You see it as two separate things. If, it, if, you, if you've got a mirror, yeah. right? So let's say, well, let's say there's, like a, there's a kind of screen between you and me, right? Or it's, it's kind of fuzzy. And there's a mirror here. Right, it bounces and I can see your face better right, in, in the mirror. Or even, let's say, just your own face. Right? You can't see your own eyes. You need a mirror in order to, to see that clearly and well. So the Prophet is just a mirror. Well, anything you see, you praise, you love in the Prophet is God's. It's from God. Right? There's no, it's loving and praising the Prophet is not separate from loving and praising God. Not in this tradition's way of thinking about it. So it's other traditions, it's set up differently. Some traditions, they focus on the founder figure, like in Buddhism, it's even kind of more central. Buddha's even more central. Well, not even, Buddha's central in a different way. In Judaism, it's different. There's not the same kind of focus on Hazrat Musa, alayhi salam. Uh, but different traditions have their own economies, their own ways of doing spiritual practice. This is one important tradition in the Islamic tradition. It's not the only one. I mean, you have some people who have played less important attention to love of the Prophet and, and, and things like that. But a really central, prominent one is this one of love for the Prophet, which is not seen as being separate from love for God at all. Love for the Prophet is love for God. Love for God is love for the Prophet.
have to discuss. Yeah. Um, you, you said that um, not every person has a love of God. So uh, in this tradition, what set this love? What makes it possible? What starts this love? And is affinity or manasaba a place a role in this? I mean, affinity between the beloved. Yeah. And the love yeah. Exactly. That yeah. There's not the same perfection. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Oh, that's a big, big, big question. So, yes, uh, usually it's there, it says that God's love is what starts it out. Um, and so creation is often described as God looking at himself in the mirror, manifesting himself. Hmm? Repeat the question. Yeah, so uh, what starts out the love and is there a role? What's the role of munasaba, of kind of relationality, appropriateness, uh, similarity between lover and beloved in this love between God and us? Obviously, because there's a big... Uh, gap in perfection <laughs> between uh, us and God. Um, and so uh, the, the way I've seen it described in a lot of the literature is God sets up creation as like a, a mirror in which to contemplate his own beauties. And so he displays his beauty, his beautiful face to, to that mirror where in which he can contemplate himself. And we're that reflection. We're that reflection. Um, and so there's this, what God loves in us is in essence his own qualities reflected back to him. So he's kind of in love with himself. And our love for him is his own love reflected back to him. Right? So that's kind of, there's, because we're made in his image, on his form, uh, we're made reflecting, or God taught Adam all the names, or there are lots of different ways to describe it. We have all of the divine names and attributes inscribed in us, which we then reflect back to God, which God loves. Um, and in, in the Quran anyway, Anytime it says God loves somebody, it's always a human being. It's not that he has other kinds of love for other beings, but this particular in the Quran that's sent for us describes the love he has for human beings and the qualities that the humans display, which are actually his qualities. So in a certain sense, God is loving himself. He's lo looking at his own reflection, he's loving himself. And when we're loving God, it's our love for God, it's his love ref reflected so, back to him. Now, there's another, well, I won't get into the, the, the uh, about, uh, well, I'll, I'll do it a, a little bit of this. In a certain sense, um, the one thing God, quote unquote, lacks is imperfection. And that's what we, that's what we bring to the table. We bring nothing <laughs> to the imperfection. Right, so that's why God said, if, you know, I created you, uh, uh, you know, I, I, if, if you didn't sin, I would take you away and replace you with a creation that does so I could forgive them. So God is the forgiver. He needs people to forgive. God, so what God, in a certain sense, God expects us, wants us. He created us weak. He expects us to, to fall short. But he wants us to do that so we turn to him in forgiveness, in, in repentance. And he accepts us with loving repentance. So tawbah means to turn. And it's just like you think in reflection. If you turn towards the mirror, the reflection turns towards you. So if you turn towards God, it's because God turns towards you, and you turn towards it. Again, like, you come to me walking, I come to you running. So there's this beautiful reciprocity, Manasaba. But on God's side, it's always more intense, more real, more strong. It's another tradition. I, I, I yearn for, I'm in longing in love for them even more intensely than they are for me. I say, so we love God, but God loves us and is seeking us even more strongly than we're seeking him. So Rumi says, you're thirsty, you're seeking water. You don't realize the water is also seeking you. The water wants to be drunk by you. Yes, I'm Not thirsty. you trying to be drunk by the water. Yeah. Any other questions? I was wondering if you um, have any thoughts about the priest traditions and other yeah. um, religions mm -hmm. that are also revolve around uh, the voice mm -hmm. and, um, and the relationship that they may have to the original traditions <laughs> in Africa, in West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, is there something that you can elaborate? Yeah, yeah, so I have a little section book on that. So in Yoruba culture, anyway, is the one I know. There's a big praise tradition called Oriki. So everybody and everything has its Oriki. It's like a praise poem, but it's more than a praise poem. So it comes from the word, Ori means head, but it literally 
means uh, like spiritual principle, origin. Uh, your ori is like your destiny that you choose in heaven before you come. It's kind of like the essence, your spiritual essence. And ki means to call forward, provoke, evoke, invoke. And so oriki, um, for example, if you go to a wedding or a funeral, if people know your family's oriki that recite it for you, and you feel it, it, does, it does something to you. It's kind of like they're evoking your ancestors and remember your ancestors, they're evoking like the essence of who you and your family are. Um, and it's kind of like bringing that out in you and then you give them money, right? Um, so it's this praise for it. And there are a lot of these traditions in the, the, man, in the kingdom of the, what's the empire of the kingdom of Mali, amazing musical uh, literary tradition of the jelly, the griots, were praise singers who would recite the lineages of kings, tell stories of even Islamic kings, like this wonderful song about Dhul Qarnayn and other things like that. So there's, there were a lot of these praise poetic traditions going around uh, as West Africa was becoming more and more Muslim. And they influenced the Medih tradition. So some of them, the rhythms of some of the uh, Medih poems were written to rhythms of these praise songs. So one of the most popular and oldest Medih uh, poems is this one by this Mauritanian Sheikh Al-Yadali. And the story is he wrote it because he heard a group of griot singers, Igawen in Mauritania, singing the song in praise of a king. And he loved the melody, so he was like, the melody is so sweet, I want to write a poem in praise of the prophet with this meter. It wasn't one of the standard meters of Arabic, but he did it anyway. And it became a big hit, it was very popular. And the king was not happy, because he said, who's this guy who you know, jacked my praise song? So he brought it before him, and they said, I heard you took my praise song. Why did you do this? He said, oh, I, I just did it because I wanted to praise someone better than you. And the king got really <laughs> mad. It's like, guards, grab him. He said, no, no, I mean, the prophet Muhammad, and then he was, the king was like, oh, okay, I can't, you know. And then Yadali recited the poem for the king, and the king wept, softened his heart, and he gave Yadali a bunch of gifts and sent him on his way. Um, so it's influenced the form of the praise poetry. It's influenced some of the imagery in some of the praise poetry in West Africa. Again, the things that you'll find elsewhere in the Arabic tradition, so things like red coral, for example, is a symbol of honor in um, coral, you know, is mentioned in the Quran, coral is in Arabic poetry, but it becomes super important because it resonates with uh, pre-Islamic or non-Islamic African traditions of praise poetry, coral, coral beads being a symbol of honor and kingship and wealth and things like that. So you can see this influence in form, in content, in style, um, and, and, this, and this is true, Let's go to South Asia, the knot tradition, and uh, things like that. You see, so you see these traditions of praise poetry. Um, I mean, even in the Islamic world itself, uh, like Busiri's Borda takes the tradition of court poetry. Busiri was a court poet. He would praise kings and write occasional poems and things like this. And so there are all these very complicated uh, features and tropes of that tradition. And then Busiri felt bad. He said, I've been praising all these people all my life. Why don't I praise the best of people? Use all my skills, all these talents. And so he and other, some other early poets in this time took that courtly tradition of poetry that had been developed to praise kings and to do all kinds of other things and turned it and used it to praise the prophet. So you see this happening kind of all, all over the place, both in terms of imagery and form and meter and melody and all of these different uh, kinds of things. So there's a wonderful, and then interestingly, then the, the Muslim things will then go influence the other ones as well. So the Bhakti tradition in South Asia, massively influenced by uh, Sufi poetry, Sufi poetry performance, a lot of it not, or Mad, Medih poetry as well too, then influences Bhakti poetry. And same thing in Nigeria as well, amongst the Yoruba, some of the styles of singing Medih poetry then influenced the way in which people would praise other things, even influencing Christian worship. And so this is all of these influences, stylistic and otherwise, going back and forth between these different traditions of, of praise. I wonder, like, with the slave trade, how much of that was carried over into yeah. the traditions of the African-American community? Yeah. I don't know about Madih in particular, but I know the the melodies and the way of reciting. So um, the only place in Western Africa where you have people singing with melisma, you know, this kind of fluctuating between notes and this kind of blue notes and flattened thirds, flattened fifths, that's, that's with Islamic 
music. So that's the area that's largely Muslim in the Sahel. And you get, as soon as kind of Islam comes in, you get a lot of melisma. You get a lot of these, these kind of flattened thirds and fifths. I don't know if you've ever heard these like uh, reciters from Sudan, even, you know, Sheikh, the late Sheikh Nourine Sadiqi, um, uh, it sounds like blues. I think part of the reason why it became so popular is Americans, and then by virtue, everybody listens to American stuff. Their music's been heavily influenced by blues music and spiritual music, which is in the same pentatonic maqams with these flatted thirds and fifths, which originally comes from these Muslim West African areas in, in the Sahel. Um, so there are these musical, I don't know about Medih in particular, but there are, are these fairly well documented connections of uh, musical traditions. Um, other people have speculated that some of these spirituals and some of the um, rituals that enslaved people would do were actually um, Sufi ceremonies, particularly from the Qadiriyah, these ceremonies that people have going counterclockwise, walking around and the accounts of people doing these kinds of things. Uh, definitely accounts of people praying. Um, lots of uh, anywhere between uh, 10 to 15% of, of the, the, the Muslims um, brought to the US, of the enslaved Africans brought to the US were Muslim. Probably about 15, you know, about 15% 15 were, were, were Muslim. So uh, a lot of Muslims who were brought here and enslaved here, and they definitely influenced the culture here. Not just here, in Brazil. So there's so many Muslims in Brazil, they mounted a kind of a, a jihad of sorts along with other slaves. They're called the Malay revolts. They're Muslims from what's today Nigeria, Yoruba, Hausa, Fulani, and others who partnered with people who were Orisha worshippers practicing traditional Yoruba religion to lead a series of revolts in the 1830s. They almost succeeded. Um, but we have the talismans that they have, we have the uh, the, the things that they wrote in Arabic. Um, so yeah, there were a lot of enslaved West African Muslims in the Caribbean. Rudolf Weir has done great work on this, showing even, so this period in West Africa, in part as a result of the slave trade, um, a lot of jihads going on, in which people, scholars, were taking up arms to fight against kings who were selling people into slavery. So the only reason they launched jihads, but it was a, main re a, a big reason. And so, Slave trade's at its height. These jihads in West Africa are at the height. So they're bringing all of these people involved in these jihad, like anti-slavery, anti-corruption, anti-whatever jihads, enslaving them, bring them over to Charleston, South Carolina, Antigua, whatever. And almost all these Rudolf Weyers track this amazingly. You see two, three months later, slave uprising. All right, so you bring some West African jihadis to Brazil, Couple months, maybe a year later, whoosh, uprising. Bring them to Antigua. Couple months later, uprising. Bring them to Charleston, South Carolina, uprising. So it's a big tradition of this, and it's remembered in, in, it's, in it's remembered in a lot of these uh, these places uh, in Brazil, particularly the the memory of the Malays, the Malay Revolt, the Muslims. They're officially honored in Candomblé, in the, the indigenous African uh, traditions that have survived in Brazil. They sing songs in honor of the Muslims. In Haitian Vodou, they sing songs in honor of the Senegal spirits, the ancestors from Senegal, and they recite the Shahada to honor the Muslim ancestors, even in Haitian Vodou um, and these traditions. So there's a large Muslim presence in the transatlantic slave trade. They had a big spiritual influence. There's even, it's not, it's tough to confirm, but there's some evidence that one of the people in charge, or one of the people who kind of sparked the Haitian revolution uh, was this figure called Dutty Bookman. Uh, he was called, he was sent to Jamaica first, they called him Dutty because that's Jamaican dirty because he was, he was a you know, leader, he fought against, uh, and then Bookman because he always carried a book with him. And they say he was from the Senegambia area and his name was Samba, so he's probably Muslim, carrying a book, it's probably the Quran. And he was one of the two people they said held the ceremony at Bouakeman, which launched the Haitian Revolution. Uh, so Muslims were involved, uh, heavily involved in a lot of these uh, revolts, movements, everyday life. Uh, Rudolf Weir has done good scholarship on this. Michael Gomez, a couple of other people who have done scholarship on presence of West African Muslims in the transatlantic slave trade. And actually, Mexico, even interestingly, in the 15th, uh, 15th and early uh, 16th century, there were so many enslaved Muslims there, they had to give them aid off. There are aid prayers in Mexico in the 16th century. because There's so many enslaved West African Muslims there. So, yeah, yeah, there's a big, big history there. I'm in the field, so I study about it, but it'd be nicer if it gets better known in, in, in the public. 
was they, they were the people who really laid the foundations of Islam in this land. Yeah, Bismillah. Um, we have yet to see a rich tradition of Madih poetry in English. So it's kind of a what comes first, chicken or the egg kind of thing. Yeah. Does the love of the Prophet come first? Or does it take people to begin working on that path of Madih poetry? Yeah, I think you call it right chicken or the egg. I think it's both. <laughs> <laughs> you know, work, working on both. I mean, mashallah, Baraka Blues, Art of Remembrance, his new book is out. You know, he's, he's got some wonderful uh, Madih in there. I should say someone else has some wonderful Madih too. Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, in the sohbah, you should ask him to bring some of those up. So. All right, inshallah. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, good, good, like good love poetry takes... Uh, kind of combination of really intense love, mastery and skill of the language, and the kind of how. Those things come together. Somebody who has the really intense love, closeness, and understanding, somebody who has kind of mastery of the language, and they have the right how, then the call will, will come, inshallah. Um, so, so yeah, if the, if you, and, and that, that then, pro I mean, the well, interesting thing that I found anyway when I try to write the things that I try to write, and but I see this in those people who actually did write really good Madih, is they say the actual composition or the act of trying to compose actually increases their love. Because when you try to sit down and write something, even if it's just for somebody else, you're focusing on them so intensely. Like, even if you just have to write a paper about, I don't know, Barack Obama or whatever. Maybe if you get into the drone strike stuff, that might decrease your love. But you know, if you're if you're writing a you know something, you're writing about a scholar or something like that from from history. You write about Imam Busiri, you write about Sheikh Shahuri, you write about any of these sheikhs. You spend so much time focusing on them, learning about them. Then your thoughts all the time. You're thinking about them, reading everything you can about them. If you're taking a shower, you're thinking about them. If you're working on this paper or something like that, you start loving it, it, that focus and attention and almost obsession increases uh, your love. So it's, it's, it's a kind of, it's a practice. Um, it's not for everybody. It's not like everybody has to write Madih poetry. Not everybody's, you know. But uh, if you have that inclination, you have that kind of constitution as like a poetic nature, try it. See what happens. It, it, can, be, it can be a wonderful thing. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think it's a virtuous circle. The more good Madih you have in English, the more love that produces, produce more Madih and so on and so forth. Any final questions? This one over there. Wa alaikum Yeah. 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 No, there are loads of loads and loads and loads of things like that. Things that are part of Black American culture. Throwing salt over your shoulder. Things with brooms. Spitting to the left. Um, uh, in Caribbean culture, as 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 well too. In Brazil, Afro-Brazilian culture, and 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 and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And some. Um, oh man, where do I even start? Um, uh, it, even to the fact, so in uh, Alan Lomax was this, uh, he was kind of anthropologist figure, went around in the, in the South in the, in the 30s as part of the Public Works Administration thing. Anyway, he was, he was, they were trying to create jobs for people during the Great Depression, and he, one of the jobs he was given was to go out and collect all these folk songs and folk stories and oral histories from people. And so he was going in the Deep South asking people about folk songs and stories, and people told them, they're like, oh yeah, I remember grandma used to pray on the bead. Grandma and grandpa, this is in the 30s, they'd say my grandma and grandpa used to pray on the bead. They were real particular about praying. They were faced east at sunrise, at dawn. Then they do it in the middle of the day. Then they do it at nighttime as well too. 
Um, so there's living memory of this stuff in the 20th century, not just people did this and they didn't know why, but people actually, you know, sounds like, that sounds like Salat to me, that sounds like a pretty clear case, and praying with beads, uh, even. Now again, keep in mind that um, Lomax was a white guy walking around in the deep south in the 30s, right? So you're not going to tell him anything that you think might get you in trouble. So who knows how much those traditions continued even after the grandparents uh, in certain places, just like in Spain as well too, deeply hidden in some places, like in the mountains, the kind of more rural, the more out of the way, the less out of state power you are. You know, the people they're, in Spain, they're always they're finding in these old houses and things, things written in Arabic scripts, even Mandih poems written in old Spanish, but in Arabic script like Ajami. You know, they found these things in old houses. So you don't know how much was preserved undercover. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of different uh, rituals, taking your shoes off when you come, come in the house, and uh, these, the aversion to pork as well, too. A lot of black, not all black American, but a lot of black American family. It wasn't just the Nation of Islam that told people don't eat no pork. Um, it's a strong aversion to pork among certain families. Um, and you can even trace certain families to particular Muslims that we know. So that like the Bailey family um, and like the South Carolina, Georgia area. Um, I think one of them was in Earth, Wind and Fire or some, something like that. But they, Bailey comes from Bilali. There was a Bilali who was a Maliki Faqih. He was on Sapelo Island. It's this island between Georgia and uh, South Carolina. Um, and we have records of him and his family and he kept the tradition alive. I think his kids were practicing and then it, it ended. But the Bailey family is descended from, from him. And there's some other you know, lineages that we can have. And oftentimes those families, uh, there'll be like a family tradition of we don't eat pork. Or we don't do this or we don't do that. Um, yeah, so there are lots of these other uh, folk. Also protective, so Islamic things made their way into what's called hudu, or root work. So some things in root work are from Native American sources, some things are from Congo and Angola, but some things are from Senegambia, Mali, the Muslim traditions of amulets and, and things like that. So you take a piece of paper and you draw a square and then you fold it up and you put it in something. So um, yeah, there are a lot of Islamic, uh, say, influences, cultural survivals, uh, or whatever you want to call it, in Black American, Caribbean, uh, Afro-Latin cultures. But again, that's not my exact, if you want to know more about, Rudolf Ware has done some great work on this, and there are lots of other scholars who've done really, really good work on this. There's a, web, a whole website, Sapelo Square, that I can recommend to you. It's all about, uh, it's mostly about Black American uh, Muslim identity, culture, and, and things like that. But they have articles about tracing influences in the history of uh, Islam in black America and things like that. Was that a question? I just wondered, there was maybe my, did so you have I just had a comment, actually. You're, you're mentioning uh, the Bailey family. Uh, yeah. Frederick Douglass, his yeah. original last name was yeah. Bailey. Yeah. So he, he's from that family, too. Yeah, yeah, he's from the, yeah. I was so we're talking about the <coughs> we're talking about people in Spain who had to hide their religion or even in the US uh, and different countries in the West. So we clearly see that in West Africa, like I never even thought of Islam as something separate from the culture. Yeah. Right, like it's, that's how it's always been, even though it didn't even originate there. Mm -hmm. And here, um, I see like, I mean, questions like, how do I love the prophet, or things that I never even had to think about, like from growing up with like mm -hmm. that fusion. So now I'm wondering, like, as a subculture in the U.S., like us living here as Muslim, like. Maybe, I don't know if it's a opposition, but at least it's definitely not the mainstream culture. How do you recreate that unity? Like what are, yeah, just, it's never, it's more just like a, what is your thought on how to, 
to like to remove that divide because I don't think you can have that love that you described as long as there's that divide. That mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think the best answer is to certainly look to the historical precedent. Um, and the, th the thing about Islam in Africa, I always like pointing this out. Islam's older on the, you know, what we call now call the African continent than it is in most of Arabia. First Hijra was to Abyssinia. So there are Qiblatain mosques in the Horn of Africa, two Qiblas, right? <laughs> there were mosques there before the Qibla changed. Right, so Islam is older in a lot of places in, you know, the Horn of Africa region than it is. It was there before it got to Syria. Right, so it's older there before it even got to some places on the Arabian Peninsula before it was like firmly established. Because the first Hijra was there, some people stayed, Islam spread. And, and uh, you know, West, a lot of parts of West Africa became Muslim at the same time like Scandinavia was becoming Christian. Right? We don't think of necessarily like, oh, Christianity is being something separate from like British culture or something like that. So yeah, it's totally... Um, but how, how, did, how was this kind of natural, uh, kind of natural blend, or how did these healthy Islamic cultures develop in the places where they developed? It's usually because the, the people who, people generally didn't become Muslim uh, by, by, by the sword. I mean, you could have to be under Muslim rule by the sword, but in West Africa, they, they, they couldn't do that because the, army, the archers were too good. So they had just had to send, they sent, people were teachers, they were Sufi saints, they came in and people were just attracted to their character or they opened Quran schools and they could use the Quran schools as daycares or the shiuch would, there'd be no rain, they'd ask the sheikh to pray, it'd rain and the king would be like, all right, cool, you know. So there's this, the same thing in Sudan as well too, they couldn't get past the Nubian archers, so they had to sign this PD, treaty that lasted for like 500 years, but which allowed for trade. And, um, and so what, what happened in these, these places with the way these healthy, I think, Muslim communities developed was it developed on the basis of, or what's really the basis of the tradition, which is love and knowledge of God, and then the other things as well too. Um, and those elements of the culture, which, uh, that, you know, the pre-existing culture, uh, which in no way contradicted the Islamic tradition, they can flourish and thrive. In fact, they're even heightened. Mm -hmm. yeah. And those elements which would be in contradiction to the Shia, they were left aside by the Muslims. But other people who were not in that, you know, would, would practice them as, as well too. But the people who were successful in spreading Islam, whether it's in South Asia, whether it's in Southeast Asia, whether it's in Central Asia, Russia, whatever, generally the people who are these intense lovers of God and the Prophet, generally saintly people. You know, kings and conquerors could put an area under Muslim rule, but that wouldn't make people Muslim. And what would make people, and people adopt Islam as their own and do their own thing with it in a beautiful way. That was usually, see like in Indonesia, you have the tradition of the Wali Songo doing the shadow puppets, you know, in West Africa, some places they would combine Kora music and things with teaching Islamic traditions. Other places they do drumming uh, with its Medih poetry played a big role in some places in, 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 in spreading uh, Islam. Um, so it's usually uh, the Prophet was the person who was the most successful at spreading Islam in the best way. So the more like the Prophet you are, the more you try to follow his example, not just outwardly, you've got the beard, and, right, but inwardly in terms of character, the more people are attracted to that. Um, so I think, yeah, we just need to do what our tradition tells us to do and just try to do our best to love the prophet, follow his example, imitate him, be as much like the prophet uh, as, as, as we can, and then practically support those institutions and people and things like that that are producing saintly people or helping us, supporting saintly people and doing the work that, that they're doing. Because that's, we'll, that's what will create a healthy culture. A healthy culture comes from healthy spirituality, which then reinforces how it's a virtuous circle. So I think that's, that's what happens. Um, but I think part of the reason why it's difficult today is there, were, there was a lot of kind of fundamental overlap and compatibility between those cultures. And I think there's in many ways more of a uh, gap, like 
Muslims could come in and speak to, let's say, Orisha worshippers or uh, Como people or you know, any of these other traditions. And they have, oh yeah, you, there's one God who's invisible and completely transcendent and yet he's kind of imminent everywhere. And they say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I get that. There's a kind of mutual recognition that it's a lot harder if what you worship is the market. Right? There's this kind of less fundamental common ground. Um, so I think that, that context of uh, that kind of modernity uh, makes it a bit more challenging. But alhamdulillah, challenging times, there's always extra mercy for the challenging times. But yeah, great question. Thanks. I have a more technical question about the poetry itself. Um, you were mentioning it has a meter, and uh, there's certain elements of it that qualify it. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit more? Like, uh, you know, because anyone can just, like you were saying, you know, say things, right? But it doesn't necessarily become poetry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what is it about the poetry that makes it such? That makes it poetry. Yeah. Right, so the Arabic poetry has all of these rules that were established uh, initially just as scripted. So that most nomadic peoples, the Arabs were great poets. Right? So you know that your art isn't going to be architecture. Right? You're not going to be talking about giant paintings. It's going to be poetry. Right? So like a lot of nomadic people are just Great poets a great poetic tradition. But like any like kind of great art tradition, people make great art first, and then other people come along and better than like, oh, these are the rules. So later on people came and like, oh, these are actually scripturally said, oh, these are the rules. This is how meter works, and there's 16 different meters or 15 different meters, and so they came along and 16. And so there's this formal tradition of how poetry works in Arabic. This is what a meter is. It's quantitative, it's not uh, like stress in English, it's quantitative. Like the number of length of syllables, short syllables, long syllables. Um, so, based on this tradition of how the Arabs were doing poetry before they even had rules for how to do poetry, then people came along and said, oh, these are the rules that you're actually been doing without explicitly saying them out. Then those became kind of fixed. It's like, these are the rules for how to do poetry. Um, and people generally followed that. But, of course, they would develop it and add all kinds of twists at different meters and like that. But as a general kind of, because you're drawing on the tradition, anytime you write something, you realize that you're not you're drawing on the tradition. So even if you're doing like crazy free poetry or something like that, you're being inspired by other people who are done. Okay. So really, true originality and creativity is very, very difficult, and that usually comes only as a result of being disciplined, consciously disciplining yourself according to a tradition. So people who are responding to this tradition of Arabic poetry. So like, um, a bunch of poets said the best way to become, if you want to write poetry in Arabic, is to memorize 10,000 lines of poetry and then forget some of them. Because <laughs> that forgetting will then allow you to be creative. So you like, try to remember it and you work it out, but then it will be your original. Okay. Um, so people were deeply steeped in education in learning poetry. Uh, was a big part of people's educational tradition. So for example, in Nigeria, there's this collection of um, Naive poetry by the Shuriat, by this Andalusian, and it's, uh, it's 20 uh, poems in praise of the Prophet. Each uh, poem is uh, kind of dedicated to one letter of the alphabet, which first begins and ends with that same letter of the alphabet. So it's like the Aleph poem, the Bad poem, the Tab poem, uh, 20, so 20, um, there are 28 of them, and each of them are 20 lines long. So it, one poem for each letter of the alphabet, each poem is 20 lines long. Very lovely, kind of artistic, flexing, and work way to get It's one of the last things that you said. And say, so if you study that, your education is complete, because you kind of know the prophet's character, his history, and all these references to all of the different disciplines, like the soul of it, the Quran, and all of these things. And so poetry is a major part of education. It's a major part of not only will people turn text into poetry to learn to help people memorize it, to teach it, but Poems itself, particularly my poems, are studied as part of the so great poems. So people are taught all this poetry and they learn the rules, either explicitly or implicitly, and then on the phone side, they do this poetry. So, like, it's not high bound, it's not completely rigid. It's like, I did that, we invented a whole new meter based on other things that you write. People are constantly doing this. It's a living tradition. In fact, so living in West Africa, there's this um, like American idol for Arabic poetry. So this poem called Amir Ashwara, Prince of Poets. And so like these different poets from all of the Arab world come on 
and it's like a competition. They recite the poems, that judges that fall on it, but they've been like half of ours and they have to complete it, and then the judges send it to comments and stuff. So 20, it's 2017, I one, think, one of those years, not too long ago, the person who won it was sending police. I'm to let it go. And his mother tongue is well off, but because he was traditionally educated, he said so much poetry, particularly poetry shaking in the Bamba. He beat all the animals in the every poetry competition. And every year, kind of even before and since then, there's been some West African or East African in the finals. Um, because of this poetry. Um, so yeah, these rules are from this tradition. The tradition is living in the ever evolved and therefore it's ever changing. Um, but it has this history uh, to it. So it's a meter and it's round. And the verse each verse is divided up into two hemistitches called mistas. And there are different forms, hasidas, krasnos, and things like that that exist in them. So that's, that's in the very, very, not, sorry, that wasn't brief. But <laughs> that's it, that's it. I loved it. I mean, like, so there's a tradition of poetry in my family, but I have not inherited that gene. So I don't know much about anything about what I'm talking about, but I used to go to, when I was very young, I used to go to Mashaira, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, where my grandfather used to uh, speak, and uh, you know, I tried to learn a little bit about our family history, and I talked to my mom about it, and you know, one of the things that she always is like, there's this concept of wasn yep, in poetry, and yeah. that's the meter, right? And then I, I, I asked for more like clarification about what is this meter? Can you explain to me exactly how it works? And I, I think there's there like there's not enough words or no, it's it's a syllable counting whether it's long or short. It's not. It's, it's, it's not, a pattern. It's a pattern of syllables. It's not exactly like a, it wasn't what you think of was like a weight, but it's not actually like a. Well, it's called weight because a certain pattern of syllables is called heavy, and a certain pattern yeah. of syllables is called light. So it's that pattern of syllables across the poem that stays the same. That's what allows you to sing. So if, if you want to, if you don't want to go into technicalities, it probably to take a little bit of time. It's, it's, so it's not too complicated, it's a little bit complicated. But basically, if you can sing a uh, melody to a poem, if a, another poem is in the same wasn't, in the same meter, you can sing the same melody with that. That's like it wasn't a shortcut. So, yeah, but it's, it's just me. English has rules to be iambic, dactylic, right. right. things like that. So they're different from you. There's an Arabic that's called the four C's. So the Shekhar and Yas's form is in Awil. Uh, the Imam series form is in a different pattern called the seat. So anything you can sing the melody of the word or two is in the same voice in the same meter. Did that meter transcend cultures? Yes, so it, they, they, yeah, it influences, so you know our languages are kind of set up different. So Turkish, Persian and Turkish meters, urban meters are influenced by Arabic meters. Because they take the basic structure of it. But because the languages are structured differently, they develop different meters. Something that sounds natural in Arabic and elegant and refined is going to be a little forced to sound like it. sound a little forced in Arabic or Turkish. Turkish especially is a very different kind of structure. But they, the meters from Arabic influence the meters in those languages. And just like the West African languages. But then as you see, the opposite can happen too. And the Delhi, there was a meter from uh, Hassaniya, a local dialect influenced by Wolof and all these other things, that influenced back his, the meter of his class. Speaking of which, one last thing. So interesting about Urdu and Persian poetry in India is Sanskrit meters influenced so you have this wonderful blending of different music, poetic reasons. You have the influence of Arabic and Persian meters and prosody, but also the influence of Sanskrit and uh, Sanskrit prosody and poetry as well. Persian, like I mean, Abusro, Sayyid, Tabrizi, and David, and these other great poets. And then, you know, Arab and Vida, you know, Arab and things like that. So speaking of poetic meters, there will be another chance to benefit from Dr. Ogunaki tomorrow evening when we'll be doing a Masabi session seeking the Qibla of the Heart um, at 7 p.m. in the community centre just next door. Um, and also on Tuesday at 4 p.m. he'll be speaking at Seattle University on healing the traumas of coloniality. Um, and as we like to say in Iran, um, first you prayer comes first after the food
But maybe we'll do. <laughs> in, in, in Mali, they say, Gabu Kakore Musiliye, which is the, the mosque is, the kitchen is older than the mosque. <laughs> But, but we'll follow whatever the uh, program is now for the two remaining components in whichever order seems most appropriate, uh, prayers and food. And thank you all for being here. And I can pass the mic to the social media department. I'll keep it really short, inshallah. Is it the Arabs? They say, إِذَا حَضَرَ الْقَعَامْ بَطَلِ الْكَلَامِ When the food comes, the word is done. <laughs> and then sometimes they like to add, add on. <laughs> once the sweets come, now people are going to start fighting. <laughs> so, Jazakallah uh, khair for everything. You know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, benefit us from you and in both, in both worlds, you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us this wonderful gathering of uh, praise poetry, really just bringing us across. Um, all of North Africa into West Africa and then back again. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta s-samir alim wa tuba alina inna ka inta tawwabu rahim Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa barik lana fi ma aafayt wa qina sharra ma qadayt inna ka taqdi wa la yukta alayt Allahumma aghfidana wa li muslimin wa muslimat wa li muminin wa li muminat al ahyari wa li muminat inna ka s-samir mujib wa da'awat اللهم اجعلنا من المؤمنين اللهم اجعلنا من المسلمين اللهم اجعلنا من المحسنين اللهم اجعلنا من المحبين وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق خاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم قد كفاني علم ربي من سؤالي